The Bible says this letter, which I am now writing to you, dear friends, is my second letter. In both of my letters, I seek to revive in your honest minds the memory of certain things so that you may recall the words spoken long ago by the holy prophets and the commandments of our Lord and Savior given you through your apostles. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I stand humbly before you, and I ask you, God, as I stand behind this sacred desk, that, God, the words that I speak will not be words of myself or flesh, but rather words of spirit. I ask God a heavenly anointing and the Holy Ghost to take full reign and full control of my life as I yield my life over to you right at this time. And I ask that same anointing and that same spirit to move in people's hearts and their lives, that you would open up their minds and open their hearts to receive, thus saith the Lord. And we all can leave this place rejoicing at the power of God. In Jesus' name, and the church said, amen. amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise. You may be seated this morning. A few weeks ago and a few Sundays ago, it's been a little while, we started the study of Peter. And we talked about Peter before he came to relationship of Christ. And then we talked to him about, we talked about Peter with Jesus. And then we talked about Peter after the resurrection, after Jesus came forth out of the tomb. And then we started the first book of Peter, and we talked about things that Peter wrote to the church. So this is the same Peter all the way back. We started these series of messages about Peter. This is the same Peter who wrote these words under the inspiration and anointing of God. And so this is what Peter says to, this, to the church. And he's talked about reviving your mind. Before we have March for Revival, how fitting Peter writes about this at concluding of chapter 3 of 2 Peter. And he said, this is my second letter. In both of my letters, I seek to revive in your honest minds the memory of certain things. And so Peter wants us to remember certain things, and we're going to be looking at what those things are today. And so today, I'm not going to preach anything new. I'm not going to preach nothing new today you've never heard before. But everything that I speak of today and everything that Peter writes about to the church today is that you would remember you've already learned this, you've already been told this, then you act upon this. Can you say, man? And so this is a time of remembering what the Lord has said in your life. He said that you recall the words spoken long ago by the holy prophets, even in the Old Testament, and then the apostles, the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as what the Lord is speaking to us today is the same thing that our grandfathers talked about and our grandparents talked about our great ancestors back all the way back to the times of the disciples and the apostles all the way before the prophets of Isaiah and Jeremiah how many knows that God has got the same law the same the same holy bible the same the the, the commands of the Lord is God doesn't change have you ever seen by around changes one day to the next depends on who's with them or whatever God God's not like that and so I want to revive your mind today, the things that you've already have heard. And we're going to continue in this chapter today, in chapter 3. The Bible says, and we're going to talk about reviving your mind. But above all, remember that in the last days, men will come who make a mock of everything. Men govern only by their own possessions, or excuse me, own passions, and asking what has become of the promise of his return? For from the time of for our forefathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have been ever since the creation of the world. And so I want to talk about the very first one, reviving your mind. But above all, remember that in the last days, how many of us were living in those last days? Remember this, in the last days, men will come to make a mock at everything. You're not going to be Mr. or Mrs. Popular in your workforce. You're not going to ever, they're going to mock your faith. They're going to mock the, the name of Jesus. They're going to come against you and laugh you, saying, who are you and what are you and, and things like that. I want you to know in the last day as we see that God is moving in our midst, the power of God is having his way. And don't you know the devil is not sitting on his hands. The devil is fighting against you today. He's going to say that these are not true, and, and he's going to try to mock the things of God. 
In other words, a mocking and also is the devil will put a counterfeit upon you and try to make you think, well, the devil has no power. God has the power. Can you say amen? amen. God has all power. And some things we get kind of confused that there is God and devil out there. Devil, the devil was a fallen angel. He's not equal with God. There is none equal as, as God. Can you say amen? And so today there are going to come men under their influence of Satan that will try to mock your faith, mock who you are, and will even, even mock the name of Jesus. Will come against the name of Jesus, and, and there will be false prophets, there will be false teachers, will tell you such as things such as there's many ways to get to heaven. Many ways, God loves everybody. You just choose however you want to live your life, and you get to go to heaven. My friend, that's not scriptural. There's a, a time that we're all going to stand before the Lord our God, and I don't want to be one of those pastors who I let down on my responsibility that I just kind of overlook certain things because I, I want to keep you happy. Here today, Peter begins to write. He said there will be come in the last days men that will mock at everything. Men govern only by their own passion. We live in a world today and we live in America today that men are driven by their own passions of life. The things that how they decide and make laws is what they have passion about. Whatever they makes them feel good, they, they will take that up on and run with that and do whatever they want to do. But I want you to know today, these are signs that Jesus is coming back soon. Men will be lovers of self and pleasures of their own selves. We live in this society today. And then they began to ask the question, whatever happened to that promise of the Lord's return? You see, I've heard it all my life. I was born in church. I was raised in church. I started preaching at the age of 15, and I preached many messages on the Lord's return throughout those years to this day today. But we are one day closer to the Lord's return. Can you say amen? One thing I do know, through many years since I was a child to this day, I preached many, many funerals. I preached many, many funerals. I preached the funerals of the, those who were saved and was ready to go to heaven, and, and we preached the funeral. And I preached funerals that they were unbelievers, and people would say, well, they're in a better place. But if they don't know Jesus, they're not in a better place, my friend. I'm not being rude to you, but I'm just saying, if they don't know Jesus, believe me, they wish they would come back to earth to have this the second life over again. Because when you talk about heaven or you talk about the pits of hell, it's for eternity. It's forever and ever and ever. And so there are things today that people say, where is the promise of the Lord's return? We hear about it. One of the things that bothers me tremendously, and men of God will predict when the Lord's return and will set a date. I have no idea when the Lord's return. I live and act like he's coming today. Is that all right with you? And tomorrow I'm going to get up and repeat the same thing. I'm looking for the Lord's return. I, I, I remember the very first time I, I got an airplane and I flew. And I got above the clouds and I just knew I was not going to land. Because it was so beautiful, I just knew Jesus was going to come and I was going to heaven. Well, I've made many trips in airplanes since then. And now I'm looking for just a simply, not a plane ride, I'm looking for an airplane, not an airplane ride, I'm looking for a plane air ride. One of the days, that's going to happen. I won't need any assistance getting me off the ground. When that trumpet blows, I'm going to be lifted by the Spirit, and I'm going to be transformed in a moment's notice. The Bible says in a twinkle of an eye. And so I began to study as a young man one time. I researched that. What is a twinkle of an eye? What, what does science say? It's one seventeen thousandth of a second. Now, your pastor can talk pretty fast, but believe me, I can't get a prayer out in one seventeen thousandth of a second. It's going to happen before I snap my finger. That's how quick it's going to happen. But when it happens, I'll not be here. Can you say amen? I hope you'll not be here either when the Lord returns. And so I don't know. I can't, ask, I can't answer when. I just got to be ready so the when happens, I'll be where I want to be. Can you say amen? The second thing I'm going to talk about, revive your, revive, revive your mind. We're going to continue in Peter's writing. It says, but there is one thing, dear friends, which you must not forget, which the Lord, with the Lord, one day resembles a thousand years, uh, and a thousand years resembles one day. 
The Lord is not slow in fulfilling his promise in the sense in some, which some men may speak of slowness, but he bears patiently with you, his desire being that no one should perish, but all that should come to repentance. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. It will be a day when the heavens will pass away in the ru- with a rushing noise. The elements will be destroyed in the fierce heat, and the earth and all the works of man will be utterly burned up. So as Peter begins to write, he says, reviving your mind by you must not forget. Why we must not forget? That the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He's, he hasn't forgotten and his timing is not ours. So one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day, according to the word of God. So when the Lord says, I'll be back with you in a second, just remember the scripture. With one minute is, is a thousand years, what is 60 seconds? It, it, it's, it's, not, it's not much, all right? It's just a drop in a bucket, but it may be a year, it may be a, more than a day in our life. So as the Lord speaks about this, the Lord will do what he said. And the devil's trick, the devil is focused upon us getting our focus on the today, what the Lord is doing this second. You know, God is working behind the scenes, and we had talked about that even today in prayer. God is working behind the scenes in all of our lives. Can you say, man, what he says he will do? You see, if God speaks something in my spirit, and I know God I, and I heard from God. You see, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm just going to help you out a little bit, all right? Sometimes people say God says and really God didn't say. Are you with me? Sometimes people think of things and they want to tie it up with God. But when God really speaks to you, you'll remember it. But when God speaks today, you can, people say, take it to the bank. I, I don't have to take it anywhere. I, when God speaks, I know it's going to happen. When God speaks it, I know it. When God, when God, God is a God that will not lie. And I believe enough of God in my life today, when God speaks something to me, I'm just going to listen and obey. Can you say amen? I can't quite, I don't understand. There, there's been a lot of people who in my life, in my ministry, from the, when I began in the ministry to, to this day, will give me good advice. And, and they mean well, but sometimes it's not God's will what they're saying in my life. Have you ever had anyone tell you that? They tell you one thing, but you know in your heart that that's not what God wants you to do. And so today, I want you to know what God's promised you. God has promised you a lot of things in your life. you got to walk in faith and believe it. Sometimes walking the walk of faith is difficult. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Walking in faith is sometimes hard to do. Sometimes we want it always instantaneously. You know, give it to us today. And God does that. God has instantaneously given me lots of miracles in my life. But sometimes God said it, but it hasn't happened. You know, David is a good person to talk about that. He was anointed king, but he didn't take leadership at that time. You see, today, sometimes God has an anointing in your life, and God has a purpose in your life. It's not everybody can see it today, but there's going to come a day that everybody's going to see the anointing upon your life at the right time. Can you say amen? So today, I want you to know what God's promised you. If he's promised you this, he's promised you that. I want you to say, well, I, I'm not seeing it happening. I, I'm confused. Don't be confused. Because it ain't God's timing yet. If God spoke it, it's going to happen. You see today, did not God speak the world into existence? Did not God speak the, the, uh, uh, the trees and the plants and everything into existence? The earth itself was without form. And God, did not God speak everything into form? I want you to know, when God speaks, something happens. You know, there comes a time in our life that we think, God, do you even hear me? Do you hear what I'm saying? And when God answers, it moves heaven and earth. When God speaks, he speaks with authority. He speaks with power. And you see, I really believe this in my life, that the devil tries to discourage us. He tries to fight against the Christians. But I want you to know that he can only do what God allows him to do. He don't have full reign. He has partial reign, but he, God, God has the limit on Satan in your life. And I want you to know when God says, that's enough, Satan, you know what that means? It's not enough. That's it. That's it. No more. And when God speaks healing in your life, you know what happens? Healing is manifested. When God speaks it, it happens. That's why I am so dependent upon the word of God. Because God's word will not return to void. When God speaks it through his word, you know what happens? It does exactly what the word says it do. 
Can somebody say amen? Amen. That should get you a little happy. So when God promises you something in your word and you read it and you begin to read the promises of God and you begin to read, hey, that, that's for my family. That's for my household. I stand up on the word of God. I want you to know when you believe it, God will perform the miracle in your life. It's when you stand up on his word. He bears patience with you. Are you thankful for that today? Remember that God doesn't give up on you. He desires being that no one should perish but it all should come to repentance. That person that aggravates you that's not saved, that person has been mocking you on your job that's not saved, God loves them. He wants to save them. He's patient. It makes me want to be patient with people too then, that I would simply do the characteristics of Jesus. With God from heaven above, are you thankful that he was patient with you and me? I am. I'm thankful I've, uh, that God has forgiven me of my sins, and he continues to do so. I want you to know he is patiently waiting and I don't know the hour that he's coming. I don't know the day that he's coming. No man knows the hour or the time. But there is a day coming where Jesus is going to step out in a cloud of glory. And Peter is reminding the church, there is a day coming, church. There is a day. He's going to come like a thief in the night. I don't know. Is it going to be morning, noon, or night? I have no idea. I don't know. And even in the world that we live in, because the hour changes from, day to, uh, from moment to moment in time zones, it's day sometimes and night somewhere. So he's going to come one time, and the whole world is going to take notice. He's going to come unexpectedly. Well, I'm expecting him to come any time. But I want you to know the world is not. The world's going to be shocked. In a moment, a twinkle in an eye. When us Christians are lifted from this earth and everybody is still around, you talk about chaos. Just for a moment, think about this. Planes that Christian pilots, they're dropping from the sky. Trains on the track. The engineer was a Christian. And what's going to happen to the unintended train? Cars on the freeway, all of a sudden one day, is going to be gone. You're at Walmart, and the checker's a Christian, and that time comes, and that lady is gone, or that man's gone. You know, there's going to be so much chaos world at that time. There's going to be chaos all around us, and the Antichrist is going to step up, and in just a matter of a few seconds, is going to solve the world's crisis, and everybody says, wow, what power, and they're going to fall down and worship the Antichrist for who he is at that same time. Us Christians and our believers of Jesus Christ are going to be around God's throne, praising God. Can somebody say, man, I want you to know today it's going to come. And all our labor, all our work, everything we've ever done in our life, the Bible says is going to be burned up. Everything's going to burn up. The only thing that's going to last is the things you did for the Lord. He puts all your things in this big pile spiritually, and that which is did it for self-glorification, did it for recognition, is all going to burn up. And that's what's remaining of that which you've done until the Lord has remained. And that's what you're going to get for your reward. And so I want to work diligently today. Can somebody say amen? Peter's telling us through the word of God, there's going to come a day. So if you want to make a difference, you need to do it now. Now is the time to work. Now is the time to serve me. Now is the time to serve the Lord. And let your treasure be laid up in heaven. Now is the time to do that. He's reminding us the words of Christ. Lay up your treasures in heaven. Where moth and rust does not corrupt. Where need thieves break in and steal. But I'm here to tell you, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Now, you talk about God's reward system. I don't know how he does it. I've never, I've never personally been to heaven, so I don't know how it goes. But studying God's word, and I've said this many times even from this pulpit here, there is a thousand-year reign that we're going to come back and reign on this earth for a thousand years. And so what you do now depends on what you're going to do for the thousand years reign. So don't get upset with your pastor if God puts me in something, whatever he would choose to put me into, because what we do now affects us what we're going to do then. Are you with me this morning? How you live today and what you do. I've said it many times, I will continue to say it, that no matter what you've done or not done, if you've done it unto the Lord, your reward in heaven will be just as great as a Billy Graham who preached to multitudes. If you was obedient to the Lord, as Billy Graham was obedient to the Lord, your reward will be just as great. God is no respecter of person. Can you say amen? amen. We're continuing reviving your mind today. In verse 11, since all these things 
were thus predesigned to dissolution that what sort of man ought to be the founder of the all holy living and godly conduct. Therefore, dear friends, since you have these expectations, earnestly seek to be found in his presence, free from the, ble the blemish or reproach and peace, and always regard the patient forbearing of our Lord and as salvation, as our dear brother Paul also has written to you, in virtue of his wisdom granted to him. So we want to talk about Paul writing. It says, revive your mind. Paul also has written to you in virtue and wisdom granted in him. Remember what Paul wrote. He says in, in verse, uh, earlier in verse 11, he says, in all holy living and godly conduct. We don't want to talk about it in the church today because it's not popular. But I believe that we must live holy before the Lord. Do I have a witness today? I really believe that. I believe that the church, I believe that the, the church has come to the place that we have allowed uh, immorality, we have allowed sin, we have allowed things to take place in our hearts, and we overlook things because we don't hurt nobody's feelings. Well, I want to tell you something. We serve a holy God. We serve a holy God. I, I, I get on Facebook and I see people's Facebook just like it, but... I'm not worried about what your pastor sees. Do you know the Lord sees it? The Lord knows the intent of your heart. He knows what you're thinking. I, he wants you to have good thoughts. He wants you to have the right response. He wants you to have the right actions. And, and to clarify things, Jesus, the Son of the living God, who left the splinters of heaven where he was sitting high up on the throne, which it still is today. He left the dirty world. He came to a world that hated him and despised him. He had temptations. He had things like you and I go through every day, yet he knew no sin. Today, I want you to know, I have been in meetings. I've been with pastors in my past. They would tell jokes that were not fitting to be talked about and mis mixed coming, more or less. A minister should never say some of those things. And I think Jesus is standing right in the middle of this conversation. I've seen laity say things off the, off the cuff, their things, speech, and we don't reverence anything anymore. They make fun of communion. They make fun of the presence of the Lord, the house of God. They, they take spirituality lightly in life. Just like, well, it may rain or may not, but don't you know we serve a holy God? The God that created everything. He is holy. He loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ. It's nothing to laugh about, a joke about. He loved you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross that you could have life and have it more abundantly. You can live above and beyond the means that you can even imagine. And yet we take what he does lightly in our life. I reverence that. I thank God. I want to serve God because of that. I want to work for the kingdom of God because of that. Because God has so good to my family, not just blessed with the material things and things that we enjoy every day and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about something much, get your eyes out of that. Get your, he has blessed me abundantly with joy, peace, comfort. I'm thankful the Holy Spirit is there when I had no one to talk to, no one to lean on. I was losing my mind and the Holy Spirit comfort me. You see, today I am thankful for it, and I give God praise for it. And because of that, I want to follow God. And the thing about this, I don't know if you have forgotten, many of you have raised children, and sometimes kids don't understand the authority that you have placed, God's placed upon you, and you speak to them, is to try to help them, not hurt them. But they don't understand why they can't stay out till 1 o'clock in the morning on a Friday night with their friends. Going there, they just don't understand that. You just, pff, Dad, you just don't get it, man. You just don't understand me. But knowing nothing good is going to happen that late at night for them, and you want to protect their spirit and their mind, you say, "Well, you be here at eleven o'clock, all right? I'll be at the door waiting for you to come back in." 
you see today, kids may not understand. Just like we sometimes with our Heavenly Father, we don't understand what God is doing in our life. But believe me, He knows what's best for you. And so whatever comes my way, I say, God, you know what you're doing. I trust you. In all my ways, I lean not to my own understanding, but I will trust you, Lord. I don't understand sometimes. People say, do you understand God? I say, no, I don't understand God. If I could, I will one day when I get to heaven, but I don't understand everything about God. His ways are so higher than mine. His thoughts are so mine, but I trust God. I mean, I understand everything, but I trust God. I trust that he knows what's best for me today. He knows what's better. When I mess up on the highway and I make a wrong turn and my phone says, you got to turn around, my wife says, what did you do, miss your turn? I said, well, maybe the Lord had something else for us. Maybe there's a purpose in it all. I don't know. But God ordains our day. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. I believe that. Everything that happens in my life happens for a purpose. Things don't just happen just to happen. The reason you had to wait a little bit longer in line, the reason why that red light seemed longer this, this day than it was the day before, maybe things happen different, but God says, I got you. I'm protecting you. I'm helping you. I'm keeping you. Are you with me this morning? And says, so, so dear friends, since you have these expectations, we talked about in Sunday school about expectations. Earnestly seek to be found in his presence, free from blemish or reproach in peace. I want to seek the Lord. Can you say amen? Because I want to know the Lord in the grave. I, I want to find Jesus deeper today than I did last week. I want to get closer today. I, I preached a message years and years ago. I was a teenager when I preached this message. And I had a little diagram. I had, how many remember the old grease boards? Remember now we got stuff on TVs and PowerPoint presentations. But back in the day, we had grease boards. And I brought a grease board to the platform, and I made a big circle on that grease board. And I put the dot, said Jesus, in the middle. And I told people, they can live anywhere in that circle you want to live. You can live anywhere. Some people like to live on the edge, one foot in, one foot out. Some people, I just get both feet in. Just breath. I choose to get as close to Jesus as I can because that's where I find true happiness, peace, and joy. I, whatever I have to do, I make my head toward Jesus. So if you can picture without a, a graphic today, if you can picture a big circle and you put a dot in the middle that says Jesus and you start walking off the edge and you're walking towards Jesus, you'll notice the closer you get to Jesus, the further the way you are the line behind you. And the closer you get to Jesus, things that were so important to you at one time don't mean nothing anymore. Are you with me this morning? The closer you get to Jesus, the things that you was worried about, what happens if and what, it doesn't mean anything. Because all you can see now is you get closer to Jesus. Been some sporting events in my lifetime. And I've sat way up high. I have sat way up high. Where you had to get binoculars out to see if it looks like ants on the ball field, all right? And I have had the privilege at times to sit real close to the ball field. Real see where you can read the numbers on the back of the people's jersey. You almost can see there what they're saying are so close. But I want you to know, the more you see a player like that, the tickets get more expensive. Think about it. It costs more. You know the same way with Christ? The more you want to see the closeness of Jesus, it's going to cost you more of this world. You're going to lay more of this world beside you. You're going to have to serve the Lord. You're going to lay some things down. You're going to give up some things. People today say, well, as long as I'm in the game, I'm happy. And some people say, but I want to see the action. Well, today I want to see Jesus. Can you say amen? The last one that Peter writes about today is found in verse 17, reviving your mind. You, therefore, dear friends, having been warned beforehand, most continually be on guard so as not to be led astray by false teaching of immoral, immoral men, nor fall from your own steadfastness. But be always growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be all glory both now and to the day of eternity. This is Peter's writing. Reviving your mind, if you've been beforehand, most continually be on your guard. In church today, if you don't get anything out of this message, you've got to pay attention right now. Be on guard. Be on guard. There's a real devil out there that hates you. 
And the moment you're not paying attention, he'll try to take that rug out from underneath and cause you to fall. You didn't see it coming that way. And what's happening in the world that we're living in today, false teachers are growing like great groves. They're coming out all kinds of teaching that's false. What is, how do you know the difference if it's a false teacher or not? Anything, listen to me, anything that is contradicting this Bible right here is a false teaching. Anything. Anything that contradicts. If it's in the Word of God and it's being taught differently, that's a false teaching. It's very simple. It's very simple. And what blows my mind, people that were one day really spiritually rooted and founded and being tricked by the enemy, getting drifted and taken away from the Bible and listen to some man or woman. They wrote a book. They got up and spoke in front of a bunch of people and, and then they're fought. And they're no more talking about it. I've said this before, and I'm not going to mention no names, but there have been men, Pentecostal men, men of God, that preach that the heaven is real. They no longer preach heaven is real. They believe heaven on earth. There's people in the Bible that I could take you to that says, you know, they used to believe in hell and believe that the people go, they're not saved. They don't believe that hell exists any longer. Why? Because they've been tricked by man and a false teaching. And now thousands of people are listening and saying, well, I didn't know. My pastor told me I could do this. Well, this pastor's not going along with the crowd, folks. I'm telling you, get in the Bible for yourself and read the Bible for yourself and understand it for yourself. If you've got any questions, I'm here to help and assist in any way I can. But you can't blame and say, I did not know. That will now cold water with God because this preacher is telling you today. You have to live unto the Lord with all your heart and your mind and soul. That's what God's required. He's not required much, if you think about it. He sent his son. God sent his son to down the cross. He's asking you to live for him, not to die for him. So be on guard. False teachers come at that of immoral men, nor fall from your own steadfastness, but always growing. How many wants to grow in God? Not groaning, God growing. You see, today I have some beautiful grandkids, and they take growing spurts. And they start growing, and one day they wake up, and their shirt's way up here because they had a growing spurt. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. The kids just do that, all right? And you see that. But I've got family members that I don't see on a regular basis. And all of a sudden they were this day, but six months later they're here, or a year later they're here. And going, wow, how did you grow? They grow up inch by inch, little by every day those kids are growing, little bit by little. We don't see it. You're around your kids all the time. You don't see them growing, but they're growing little bit by little bit by little bit, just like us Christians today. We grow a little bit by little bit by little bit. It doesn't mastermind overnight. You was a babe in Christ today, and now you, don't. you, you, you start. Remember babies? They're not running they're being held. Then you put them down. They start to walk in. And you're all excited about that. And you're, I mean, Grandma and Grandpa are so excited. That child is growing. Yet, in just a few years, they'd be walking in some things you don't want to walk into. It all started because you were so excited they were going to walk, all right? So we see we're excited for these little babies growing and doing. But we should be the same way spiritually. We should be growing in the kingdom of God. We should be growing. If we're not growing... Well, you know the rest of the story. If you're not growing, you're what? You're dying. That is correct. I don't want to be dying for Jesus. I want to be growing for Jesus. Can you say it, man? Now, you see, today, I remember, you know, being kids, and my dad would have different types of gardens in our household and all that, and, and we would plant something, and I'd go out the next day expecting to see something growing, coming out of the ground. Nothing was ground. And then my father would come home one day, and he would get so excited. I'm thinking, why is he so excited? There's something sticking out of the ground that looks like that. I, I can't eat it. It ain't productive to me. I don't know why he's so excited. I just see a little, but I didn't realize 
that means something's happening underneath. And if growing, if you start seeing people grow a little bit, something's happening inside. Something's taking place in your life. And that makes me excited today to see, and I see the church of Jubilee as a church in that condition. I see the church growing. And as the church grows, I get excited. I just get excited. I can't help myself to see things growing. How many want to continue to grow for the kingdom of God? I really want to see us grow and continue. I don't want to get a growth. So, well, we, we got it made. We got, we, we got more growing to do. Can you say amen? But always growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. To him all glory both now and the day of eternity.